the delay. Welcome to this uh, talk by Professor Dr. Manfred Hauswirtz. Um, most of you know Manfred, right? He was in Switzerland for some time. Well, originally, he got his PhD from TU Vienna, then moved to EPFL in Karl Adolf's group as a postdoc for about four or five years. He was then appointed vice director of Derry in Ireland. And now he's a professor at TU Berlin and the director of a small farm opera institute of about 500 people. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you back here, Manfred. Um, uh, Manfred will talk today about linking everything. The floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Philippe. It's a great pleasure being uh, here in Switzerland again. And uh, in the presentation, as you probably have read in the abstract, I'm going to go a little bit through the work that has accumulated in the last 10, 12 years, because uh, I know that this title, linking everything, is a little bit okay, boasting, uh, but I think we have done, in the course of the last 10, 12 years, some significant work, and uh, it's now time to put the pieces together and also identify a little bit where the gaps still are. So linking everything is my way of thinking of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, or how you, uh, how you want to call it. All right, that's, that's a pretty old slide. Some uh, who have seen the dairy presentations may probably know that. But uh, nevertheless, even though it's old, it's still correct. The goal of uh, the work that I've been doing in most of my scientific career is how can I translate that into that, a network of information units at various level so that you can actually use it for problem solving. Networking per se is, is not necessarily a value. I mean, it's great if you can network things, but you should always think of networking with a purpose. Just that you can network doesn't mean that it actually creates value, but if you do it in the right way, it may actually help you to do things better. Now, uh, this is not only what uh, I and other people have been saying over the last 10 years. This is a picture from a study about cyber-physical systems. Architec is the German Academy of Sciences for Technology. And they say you have various layers from embedded systems, networked embedded devices, cyber-physical systems, however you want to call it, up to uh, the Internet of Everything layer, and I'll talk about it in a minute, what that uh, means. And they all enable some form of networking. Th with this networking, now we need to do something useful. What could that be? Now, Cisco, and I hate them for inventing the term because, it, in my opinion, it's really a good term, call this the Internet of Everything. Why the Internet of Everything? Because now, small devices, people, cell phones, computers, industry plants, you name it, even your washing machine has the potential to get on the internet. Now that is something that's only interesting for technology aficionados. My wife would probably kill me if I reprogram our washing machine and she can't wash the, uh, the clothes for the kids. So why is that good? Well, the I idea behind this Internet of Everything is the same idea as behind the Internet, that you come up with simple abstractions for any kind of source and any kind of destination, be it on the networking or on the information or on the knowledge level. And if there is a good purpose to network, you can easily do it. Now, interneting means you have to take people into account, you have to take things into account, you have to take data into account, and you have to take processes into account. If you only look at, at one of these areas, you will have an incomplete picture. And there's even more to the picture. It's just for the simplicity of the talk, because it's not about the general model. I am uh, only talking about uh, these four bubbles. Now, first, let's start. Wh what kind of information sources do we actually have? Because, I mean, networking without information you can network is pretty futile. So uh, I just looked around in Berlin, so there's plenty of Twitter channels. There is traffic information, there's smart metering, there are smart homes. There's a whole lot of geo information that you can also geo-reference that. There's weather information. They have RFID controlled waste bins so that the waste truck only goes there if there is waste actually in the waste bin. 
Uh, it's interesting to note as anecdotal evidence that obviously waste trucks are a major source of traffic jams in any major city in the world. So even though this may sound like, okay, why would we do that? It has some sense, and there are plenty of other information sources. So the information is there. Now, is this information useful? This is a study that uh, came out in 2013 where a couple of consulting companies, IBM, etc., analyzed uh, what you could do with information available in the city. But this is just an, this is just an example. So this is, this is the analysis that they did for Rome. So you have plenty of information. You, know, you have cell tower information, you have traffic information, you have information from citizens, you have geo information, all kind of, of information. But what you really don't have, at least in Rome, and I would claim for most of the other uh, even if the cities are being called smart cities, most of the other cities, you don't have the information networked in a way that's easily accessible and useful. You have it as part of specialized services. So, you know, like Google does an incredible job with traffic uh, forecasts and all kind of thing, but it's essentially stovepipe. You have to go to a company to get it. But this is also not, for example, how the original internet started to work. The original internet started to work because you had simple protocols, simple APIs, and you agreed on a couple of standards, and boom, you wait for some time, it goes out of the, out of the university labs, and you can do great things. So it makes sense not only to rely to the stovepipe services, because if you do it in that way, it will stay in the stovepipe. That's the story that the web people have been preaching uh, over years. There are also good arc e economic arguments why you should do that, because you could say, okay, what's, what's, the, what's my motivation to give away the data? What's my motivation to do uh, networking? What's the purpose besides serving the greater good of uh, advancing society or the well-being of humans? Well, you can actually make a whole lot of money out of it. This is a, a forecast out of the latest Cisco white paper who say, that they estimate it's a 4.14 trillion dollar market. They invest currently billions, specifically Cisco is very active there, to actually address that market. Why are they doing that? The network market, the traditional networking market that Cisco is in, has a fixed size. And it's not gonna grow substantially in the near future or even in the long-term future. So what are new sources for revenue for a company like Cisco? I mean, you still have to uh, find areas where you can actually make money or you can grow. Uh, also other companies, it's not only, you know, like uh, the American companies who say that, but even, you know, the, how would you say, uh, kind of in a, in a positive way, old-fashioned European companies like Bosch, because Bosch is not an internet company. You know, Bosch may manufacture 50% of the sensors that are around in any kind of mobile phone on the planet, but they don't go into these hype cycles easily. And even they came out with a very interesting white paper, and this white paper says, uh, what are the business models for the Internet of Things? Remember, uh, at the beginning I said, okay, networking is great, but why do you do it? You need to do networking with a purpose. And Bosch said, okay, you need to start now, you need to go into new markets and you need to find out how you can make money because if you don't, somebody else will do and you will go out of business. And they cite a couple of prominent examples like Quelle, that's a, that used to be the largest uh, German non-electronic Amazon. They don't exist, they went bankrupt I within a couple of years. Koga, uh, Kodak for, uh, didn't go into the digital camera market and there are plenty of other examples. All right. Now, since I have a web background, I say, okay, that's uh, why we need linked data. Uh, we need linked data because linked data gives you, an, uh, gives you the possibility to integrate uh, information from a very large number of sources. We do that on the web, but uh, I claim it also wor works for other areas. The problem in a lot of areas is that a lot of people have worked very successfully with uh, closed approaches, but they have hit the limits. So you need to open up. Then there, of course, has also been discussion why would you use semantic web technologies? And this is a, this is a quote from uh, David Karga out of his uh, ESWC 2013 keynote. I mean, if there's one thing that the semantic web and the web people are really good is integrating information from a large amount of information sources. Then you already have a large amount of information. 
out there, for example, geographical and governmental data sets. Uh, European legislation is in place that actually all public information will have to be uh, published as, uh, as linked data. And that's an enormous incentive because let's say you're a logistics company, you need to comply with uh, European legislation from source to uh, uh, destination to uh, uh, reliably demonstrate and show that you fulfill certain government's requirements. This is the easiest way to do that. And a lot of other people, non-traditional web companies, let me put it that way, because Google is not necessarily uh, a promoter of linked data, have seen, or, or Facebook have seen, that this graph-based data is actually something useful. And in the end, linked data is nothing but a certain way of expressing uh, link, uh, graph based data in a syntactic way and a little bit of rules how you should how you should do it best practices that's all it's not rocket science the nice thing that you can do on top of that and i rush rush through that a little bit is if you use rdf and vocabularies you have one syntax and you can assign meanings this means uh, you can uh, automate some uh, integration jobs and sometimes even to a large extent if the data is not very noisy. That's very cool. That's one of the most expensive tasks that you have in uh, computer science because companies like Oracle or IBM make most of their money out of data integration. And a lot of this data integration is done with all the approaches. Why graphs and ontologies? You know that. You can easily integrate. I am not going to go into detail with that. The lingua franca for that is going to be uh, linked data. A lot of linked data is around. I hope you, you believe me. And there's a lot of governmental data. There's a lot of commercial data. And this linked data graph is growing dramatically. What's interesting to note is it used to be DBpedia that is in the center here, because that's the definition of terms. But what's interesting to note that now the geo data sets have become equally important. And that's not surprising. I mean, you need the definition of terms so you know what you're talking about. And location, space, is simply most important for uh, any kind of application, specifically applications when you go, for example, in the world of the Internet of Things, because sensors always need to be located because you do readings at a location and about the location. Now, why linked data or streaming information? because I'm also hopping a little bit at, at, uh, ahead. The data that we're talking about so far is mostly seen to be static, but that's only part of the story. If you think about it, if you go really go into the Internet of Things, if you go into industry, if you go into uh, traffic control, if you go into cars, you constantly create information. So it's actually not only static data, it's not snapshot data, data you constantly create information. And uh, I claim you should use the same data models and the same APIs and the same descriptions as you do for linked data because you, then you can easily integrate it. Then you can do things like you have cars that have a geolocation, you have a geo data set, you do a simple database join and you know where you are. With traditional uh, software systems this is a complicated task. In this kind of approach you can do it in a very declarative fashion. That's of course a little bit simplifying, but compared to the development effort that you have to put in, in a lot of areas, it's really easy. And it's also a mind opener for some people. If you think of people who traditionally do embedded systems, you know, those are the guys who program assembler C, uh, very resource efficient, and uh, everything is hand grafted, which means the effort to maintain these systems is really large. And then if you connect different sensors from diff or a different embedded systems from different manufacturers into back-end information systems. You need to be an expert in any of the platforms plus the back-end information system, which is crazy, and you don't find these people on the market. So it actually doesn't scale, simply in terms of workforce and knowledge. But if, you have lo if we have learned one thing from the web, you give people an inefficient protocol, nobody will claim that uh, HTTP is an efficient protocol, it's actually probably the most inefficient protocol that you can think of for a distributed system because it's also ta targeted at the human reader, but nevertheless it's easy to understand. You give, uh, give people a simple abstraction, you give uh, people simple interfaces, and suddenly you open up the market for an enormous amount of developers and applications start. Because 
the nicest model doesn't help you if it doesn't manifest itself in, in the real world. I mean, be it in non-commercial or commercial systems. Then it's a nice thought experiment, but you have created nothing. And computer science is still science, and you do something in the real world. It's also an engineering discipline. So what are the challenges? The first challenge is that you have to deal with graphs. Now, that's actually something extremely old. Uh, network databases, that's how, they, how this was called in the 70s, are the, were the original data model. But in the 70s, you just didn't have the research, you didn't have the software, you didn't have the hardware to deal with that. And uh, all the database people in the room, forgive me, uh, relational databases were invented as a shortcut because that was something that you could compute efficiently. And that's perfectly okay, and relational databases won't go away, but now we have the capabilities and actually the, the best data model for uh, modeling and implementing this very large scale distributed systems with a lot of sources and a lot of consumers is a graph based model. The problem is that the graphs can get really huge or humongous, <laughs> a vast. <laughs> uh, so I was looking for a nice graph, so th this is my LinkedIn graph for, uh, for, uh, of two or three years ago, while they still offered the functionality. And this is not big. So this is some 500 nodes and, and a lot of connections, but this is not a big graph, so this is more the usual query you would ask in an infrastructure, for example, if, you, if a, a ca smart car moves through an infrastructure. And this graph is big. And we have no idea how big it is. Actually, we need to experiment. A lot of data will be represented in these graphs, and this is uh, just some industry statements that uh, I'm not saying, claiming this as a research. I mean, I have to back this up with industry statements. So IBM, and I think they uh, actually upped the 40 44 times already considerably, says that we are increasing the amount of data by 2020 uh, 44 times. 90% of the data, uh, and there's a lot of data actually from the Internet of Things has created just in the last two years alone. So it's not the web. The web or the semantic web is actually shrinking in the relative size of the data that's being produced because a lot more of other areas are opening up. What's really important there, and I think that's right, you need scalable frameworks, you need streaming, and you need uh, new kinds of, uh, of integration. Uh, ways of, of integration this, uh, integrating this information. The big problem with these graphs is that they are dynamic. This is uh, a, vis a slowed down visualization of 10 million tweets that happened after the Xbox One was published, and this happened in 10 seconds, so it, it normally goes like <laughs> But it, it's a nice demonstrator what happens when you deal with graph. So you have isolated, it's played in a loop, I you have a isolated information items and then connections between these is uh, isolated information items form in the, in the case of tweets, it answers, retweets, and things like that. And you have emergent structures, which means your graph evolves over time and you want to process queries, active and reactive queries on top of this, uh, of this graph. So you either actively ask or you say, if these conditions are met, send a, da send a data item. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, look at these uh, data, uh, dynamic data alone, but there's always a lot of static data behind. I mean, just think of uh, rules you need to comply with in a, in a governance model. Now, the first shot we took at these kind of systems was, okay, we, def we take a graph database and combine it with a stream processor. And that was, I can already tell you now, hilariously inefficient. Didn't work, didn't scale was the wrong approach. I'll show you in a, sl in a couple of slides why this was so inefficient. Now, the idea based on these assumptions was, okay, let's come up with a simple abstraction also for dynamic data. Now we say, okay, we've, oopsie, we have a simple data model, we have a simple interface, we hide any information source, be it a database or a completely low capability 48 kilobyte ma main memory sensor, we implement all the standards and the people can focus on uh, writing the application on top of it. And for most of the applications, I'm not talking about, okay, this is the controller, uh, this is not uh, something you would use for assisted driving in a real-time system in a car. 
But for a lot of other applications, let's say, in tracking and traces, in healthcare, that's completely sufficient. You'd, you are perfectly happy with kind of soft real time. As long as it's a matter of seconds or below seconds, that's, that's pretty okay. Now, to address these problems at the various level, we've done a couple of projects over the years. So the first level, which was really kind of like, is it doable at all? Because I mean, if you have a nice abstraction and your underlying systems then use something completely different, well, then uh, probably the abstraction is not so nice as you would have claimed, was to really go down to the most, uh, to, the, to the lowest re uh, resource level on the Internet of Things and see whether those guys could actually speak REST, could deal with linked data, and you could still run uh, all the networking protocols. So we investigated whether we can use semantic descriptions of sensors and the data, not in a database, in the sensor itself. So you turn on a sensor that can tell you what it is. You can connect to a stupid simple sensor as you would connect to a website. You can access it via RESTful interfaces and you can still use IP and it works and you don't drain the battery. So that's what that was a pretty challenging environment. So the first thing with the description that was easy because at the same time the semantic sensor network uh, working group of W3C started and created some nice framework. That's not standardized yet. The standardization starts now. It's going to happen. Uh, we can just rely on that. Okay, that's just a, a visualization of the main components. The nice thing about the SSN ontology is that it didn't start anew, but uh, we took work from the Open Geospatial Consortium. We took uh, work from people who know how to, uh, who have created event ontologies, time ontologies, whatever, and we integrated it in a way that you could use it. In a, in a compatible fashion. Then uh, we tried to go down to the, uh, to the really the sensor level. And this was a project called Spitfire, semantic service enabling for future internet research by experimentation, I think was the name. And uh, we thought mm, it actually works. We just have to add a little bit of descriptions that we use for running the systems. So, for example, we needed to uh, talk about link quality of wireless links. We needed to talk about energy classes and things like that. But it was not rocket science. We tried to come up with a small uh, compatible addition to SSN and could describe it. And we implemented this on very low capability sensors. The demo actually that we did with the, with the Spitfire project and won the best demo award across all EU projects and the second prize at the Internet of Things Challenge in Wuxi in China. And for example, companies like Siemens are using that now. Now, how did we do that? The most important thing, and that's the obvious lesson to be learned, is that size matters if with uh, systems that have very low resources. So what we did was we had sensors. I mean, actually now the resources are significantly higher with 48 kilobytes of main memory. You need, need to put on the operating system. Six low pan is the IPv6 implementation for sensors. Co-op is constrained application protocol. That's HTTP for sensors. That's already standardized by the uh, IETF. And we contributed some of the standardization for conditional access plus semantic descriptions into 48 kilobytes of main memory plus four to five. Uh, so you could only actually use say 40 kilobytes and then you needed to ensure that you still have processing power. Sensors have sleep wake cycles, so it's no permanent connectivity and you needed to get all this uh, together. So for example, we had people on board in this project, mathematicians that are really good in game theory because essentially you, you end up with a game theoretic problem when you do what where. And it, it's tricky. Uh, also, of course, and this is where, where size matters, you cannot store text on a sensor. I mean, this is what much too worded. This is towards the, the uh, human. So we, we also came up with a binary format. One of the things that we tested, okay, how many triples can we actually get on a sensor? Remember, you turn it on and the environment knows who you are, what protocols you speak, how you can be accessed, and vice versa. That is the, that's the goal. And uh, depending on the encoding, it's between 34 and 40 triples. So that's not a whole lot. So uh, do you know co-op? Otherwise, I tell a few words about that because that's an interesting thing. Okay, co-op is uh, actually not coming out of the web community, but coming out of the embedded systems and sensors community and has the backing of all sensor manufacturers where they said, hmm, those web guys got it right. They had a simple abstraction. 
they have HTTP and we have 25 protocols or 50 protocols. So what they did is like, how can we come up with a version of HTTP that is uh, lightweight enough that we can run it on, uh, on simple sensors? So they even thought of, uh, of RESTful interfaces and they even thought of their way of semantics. I mean, you may argue, you know, you should have done this differently, but in, in essence, the ideas were all correct. And it's being standardized by the e IETF already. Well, for the sensors itself, you can't. Because, you know, uh, a sensor, you get a, a 1.5 volt battery, and please uh, make this uh, energy last for two years. So sensors sleep most of the time, wake up, send something, so build up an IP connection, and then they, they go to sleep again. Additionally, if you do not have a standardized protocol, so HTTP is way too heavy. If you do not have a standardized protocol, this is the standardized protocol from the sensor to the outside world, you have to uh, uh, update your proxy with any of the new protocols that are coming. And new protocols in the sensor world came in on a daily basis. New manufacturer, new protocol. And these protocols were, how do I say this in a friendly way, shite. Because uh, the what I've seen there in terms of protocol is like, okay, I don't care, I'm a hardware manufacturer and I do some things that somebody will read. I even saw protocols that were uh, supposed to produce XML, and I mean, yes, they looked like XM XML, but uh, they were syntactically incorrect and things like that. So it's really important that you come up with a standardized protocol, and this was the idea behind co-op. And they did not standardize one of the existing protocols. They said, let's do it, let's follow the same uh, guidelines like the web people have shown us very successfully, but dump it down and make it lightweight so that it's easy to implement and doesn't drain our en energy. Then, once you have this initial bootstrapping st uh, step, then of course you can put all kind of proxies, what you have proposed, and everything in, t uh, in the background. But the first hurdle you have to take is that bootstrapping uh, step. Bootstrapping step. Uh, and I it's very simple. It's essentially, if this is the normal stack for HTTP, you see, they just use UDP, the lightweight, uh, lightweight version, uh, on, on top of constraint links. But the important thing is they, they hide. This can, be can become pretty messy. And they hide it behind an HTTP abstraction, quote, unquote. And you can rely on it because it's going to it's it is being standardized. And the nice thing on top of that, so we built a small co-op plugin for Firefox. You could just connect to your... 48 kilobyte sensor and you could speak rest to the sensor so we could we could have stopped there i mean you don't need semantics that is pretty much what you need on the web and you can build an application that is sensor enabled with your knowledge of web standards then we were thinking okay can you do a little bit more and actually other guys guys from uh, technical university of braunschweig built a sparkle store for these 48 uh, kilobyte sensors with all the other stuff so that you could actually post simple Sparkle queries. I mean, a dumped down version of Sparkle, but they were processed on the sensor. All right. What we then did in my group is what we were looking at this problem of, uh, of streams. How can you do that? How can you integrate that uh, in the same uh, database abstraction and uh, use the same language also to process streams and static data? And there, we came up with oopsie, with a system which we termed SQLs. So pun intended, SQL is uh, the way most Americans would pronounce uh, SQL for, for streams. Uh, and we wanted to provide an abstraction that works both on the new standards, but also works on standards that are existing. Now, there we could base on a large uh, uh, amount of work that started 13 years ago at EPFL as part of uh, NCC Mix, the old group Philip and I originally worked in that's still being developed. So this allows us to put in any 
existing sensors and present them as linked data. And this allows us to, based on the new standards, and also present them as linked data. So uh, what does it mean? In, in this query processor, what we wanted to do, we have static data, we have dynamic data. We do a simple query, uh, simple uh, Sparkle query, and irrespective whether it's dynamic or static, we do the usual thing, pre-processing optimi optimization, and execute it, and come up with an answer efficiently. Both for active queries that I ask, so ad hoc, uh, or reactive queries where I say, okay, this is my filter condition, and that's the Sparkle query, and I get results based on the execution of that query. This is a little. Uh, this is a visualization of the model that we that we use. So you have a stream of information, which is essentially a graph that changes both in terms of the values, but also the connections. And you have some metadata on top of that that describes that stream. So classical semantic web. What's a little bit tricky is that for some pieces of information, it's no longer clear whether they are actually data or metadata. Think of location. Location in most systems traditionally was metadata because you had a location. Now, if you're a car, that's no metadata. That's a stream of positions. So it may be still metadata, but it's still, uh, it's still a stream. So it's actually data. So we said, OK, we don't care. Uh, both sides can be dynamic. Also, the description can be dynamic. So we apply the same uh, computing abstractions on top of that. Now coming back to this, okay, why didn't we put together a stream processor with a static database? So what happens when you do that? First, you need to rewrite your query into the target system, which is quite a bit of overhead, and rewrite it back. And you treat the systems as black boxes, so you miss out on a whole lot of optimization potential. Just think of a materialized query where then one uh, data item actually is joined and the you throw away the rest. If you cannot look into the query processor, you will never be able to optimize that. So it's really important that you can look into. By uh, And we didn't do this lightheartedly because it would have been much easier for us to just use existing components and be happy with that. And you know, like if that would have meant that you have a performance pe uh, penalty of say 10, 15, 20%, okay, who cares? But the performance penalty was a factor from 1,000 to 10,000. And that's pretty, pretty dramatic. So what we did is we uh, built our own uh, query processor and our own data structures where we applied a lot of existing database theory and a lot of existing database uh, results. And essentially, you know, you get a query, you have an optimizer, you execute that. At some point in time, you, you compute because that's the difference to static query processing. You have to see whether your logical and physical query execution plan still is some kind of optimal plan. If the costs change dramatically, then you probably should switch to another uh, query plan that's different from traditional query processing where you, opt where you, you do this cycle once. And then you have to be careful that you don't do this too often because you can easily get in an oscillating behavior where you constantly switch query plans, but you do not do actual processing. Uh, okay, we used pretty straightforward indexing. I mean, uh, we really looked into the database literature, so there are a lot of results, and I'm citing the papers we used uh, on one of the following slides to be really optimal. There are also some very nice results from the database community that, that where they say, okay, what you should not use for RDF, even though the database community has uh, uh, promoted that for a couple of years, prominent database people said, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. And uh, here is uh, what we use. So, I mean, the typical thing, that the classical timing approach. So that's not uh, something you, we use a heartbeat approach. So there has to be some kind of heartbeat, which is not, uh, it's kind of a soft, synchronized, distributed heartbeat because you won't be enforce, able to enforce this in a distributed uh, environment uh, reliably. We used uh, a lot of the encodings that uh, relational database people have proposed for non-SQL uh, and relational databases. We used a couple of, uh, or adapted a couple of cost models that were w easy and good to adapt, adapt to graph data. And we used, uh, this, is, this is pretty central, uh, abstract windowing buffer from uh, Kramer and Seeger that really, uh, that, that was a, a very nice piece that came in, in, in place for stream processing. Okay, there's also, uh, I'm, because, hot and late. 
Uh, we, uh, you see, we did quite extensive uh, background checks. Uh, there are a lot of famous database people where you say, okay, row-based data structures are not good. Time stamping and negative tuples because your streams, you know, you need to invalidate stuff, don't work. There's an enormous amount of, of database work you can uh, rely on. We combined it and did the missing pieces on top. We designed that for one CPU. That actually gave us performance gains, really compared to the to the other systems, in uh, the range of 1,000 times faster and more throughput to other systems, where we were hesitant even to publish the the results because they looked fabricated. You know, if somebody tells you I am 1,000 times faster than the competition, then usually you know the alarm bells go off because this doesn't come along very often, so we were very skeptical to our own work. And then we thought, okay, can we now put that into the cloud, and how do we perform if we do massively parallel processing? Massively parallel, not only in terms of storage, but also massively parallel, let's say, we have 10,000 parallel queries. Can we deal with that? We implemented that uh, uh, on top of the Amazon AC2 cloud. You can also download it. It's called SQL's Cloud and just some, uh, some results. So uh, we just tried uh, bigger and bigger joins and uh, what our performance is. So for example, this is ESPA, this is IBM's system, stream processor. We only tested the stream processing performance. This is a logarithmic scale. This is ESPA and this is uh, our best system. So th all, the, all the top three are variations of our system and this is our system. That's, that's two years ago, so the, the current version is even more efficient. You, uh, uh, this is a four-way joint linear graph, but you have it pretty much consistently over any kind of, of joint. It's just because we also understood the data structure better in, in uh, favor of ESPER. I mean, ESPER is a general purpose stream processor. Uh, parallel queries was quite interesting. So you see, again, logarithmic scale, this is the performance of ESPA with parallel queries. And that dramatically drops. I mean, uh, if it wouldn't be a, a logarithmic scale, it would be like that. So essentially, ESPA does not scale when it comes to parallel queries. And that's, that's an essential finding. Whereas we stay pretty much in the same range of, uh, of efficiency. Then, um, we also did all kind of benchmarks. Uh, it's in the ISWC paper about that. It's interesting to see that for some queries, but this is just uh, anecdotal evidence, we scale linearly. Some queries, of course, aggregation cannot scale linearly. But usually, uh, the, the essence, the takeaway message from the measurements was you throw more hardware at the problem and you uh, can deal with higher query loads, essentially. Uh, then uh, we also looked at, do we ac are we actually doing the correct thing? I mean, database semantics and query processing semantics is not an easy thing. Even for traditional databases, it took a while until SQL databases actually produced the same results for the same query. Now, uh, we thought, hmm, let's look at this also for stream processors, and we did an extensive set, so these are all kind of different queries. This is filter, join, uh, aggregation, nested query, negation, union, and what's T? Top K. So, uh, uh, and here you just see who implements what. Uh, interesting to note, no, it doesn't really work. So this is SQLs, this is CSparkly, this is JTALIS. This at that time they were the leading systems. So for example, some systems don't produce a result. This is due to JTALIS being on, uh, uh, based on Prolog, and uh, it simply doesn't scale and, and runs out of memory. But we get errors, we get syntax errors, and all kind of weird stuff where we don't produce a result. So no stream processor is perfect. That's the essence. But even worse, they don't produce the same results. And that's the bad thing. Now, uh, for example, if you do a query here, you should see that's the result set. I mean, how can it be that we find uh, 68 triples in the result, uh, C Sparkly 604 and Chetali 68. And uh, this is consistent for a couple of other things. You see that SQLs and JTALIS are most of the time, uh, most of the time agree, not always, also not here. So we really need to dig deep into the implementation to find out why you get a, a uh, completely different result for the, the same query. 
and uh, it's not it's not finished yet. Essentially, there are different underlying assumptions how you how you deal with updates. So, in SQLs, we uh, run the query as or we recompute the query as soon and as a new data item arrives, whereas C Sparkle, for example, has a fixed time beat, which it depends, you know, like on the on the interval, uh, what results you produce, which in my opinion is not a good uh, way of doing it. All right, then the question, yeah. One question is there's one more picture about 6.4 uh, result performance. Now, um, it's almost um, primitive to that you have to have a query or data type return where 500 of them are still null. Yes, uh, part of the results are invalid, and part of this uh, part of this happens that you know if you if you calculate or if you compute the result set at fixed uh, amounts of time, you're probably looking at the st at the stream at completely the wrong time where nothing has happened, and you accu accumulate your results. And this is exactly what happened, for example, in this case or in this case. Uh, this case was a little bit more complicated. So uh, there, it's, it was even hard to figure out what was correct, or either of the results were correct uh, by looking at the code. But it's interesting to know that uh, based on that paper, we can claim that all the c uh, comparisons of stream processors are invalid. Because, I mean, if you produce different results, you cannot compare them, and if you, if, uh, it, it's meaningless, and that's that's actually a very bad result. So there needs to be uh, uh, more brain power in uh, in uh, these benchmarks. Now uh, the next thing was to make it even more scalable, because why do you at all have to deal with web standards if you don't want to deal with web standards? I mean, it's just a means to an end. So we said, okay, let's build a, a, a middleware on top of that, because most application programmers are good in dealing with middleware. So uh, we came up with a system that completely abstracts away the, the underlying web standards and you can just use it as a via an API and it runs on top of Hadoop and, and the typical clouds. Then to demonstrate it, we call it linked stream middleware. And to demonstrate that this is actually good and useful, uh, my team went around and tried to get hold of any kind of sensors they on the world that's freely accessible. Uh, it's roughly 115 to 116,000 sensors. A lot of this information is quite boring information. It's weather information. It doesn't really change frequently. Some stuff is really interesting. Specifically, London is very nice and generous with getting access to train information, to bike information, to traffic information. We have traffic cameras, we have train. And what you can do, and that's quite easily, and that is one of our easy demos, for example, to find out when trains at certain stations in London arrive, whether they are on time, on what platform is boils down to a simple query using that infrastructure. Behind that infrastructure, you have a Sparkle endpoint, so you can use that also as a way to build an application. I mean, it's a proof of concept. It's not in the industry, sta uh, industry thing, but it's case. And the nice thing is you get all the data. This is also something we did. All the data you get from the streams is uh, valid RDF and annotated valid RDF. That's a newer and nicer version, which we now call Graph of Things, where we also integrated uh, new systems uh, from the networking side. In my new institute, we do a lot of uh, in M2M communication, so we integrated 5G and M2M standards so that uh, you can also access those sensors, fulfilling those standards. And then, and this is, a, this is just a little bit of playing, we thought, okay, maybe the expressivity of Sparkle is nice, but not enough. What you would like to have is actually rules. So, but uh, rule and rules, uh, rule engines on top of streaming data, they are either at the very beginning or what they do is not really scalable. So we thought, okay, can we come up with a meaningful combination? It's, it's the same pattern as we originally tried with streams and static data that part of the rules we rewrite into Sparkle, and what we cannot rewrite, we try to process uh, with a rule, rule engine. And to a certain uh, extent, that uh, works. Ah, sorry, no, I'm, t I'm talking about stream rule. The super stream collider is, is software engineering, sorry. Th there we, okay, back. The super stream collider is, okay, how can we further abstract it away? Because every 
every uh, programming job for streams is essentially you have inputs, you do some processing, and you produce a structured output or, or a non-structured output, we don't care. You give it a name, and then you can combine this processing. Classical data stream processing from a data flow processing, as they called it in the 70s, just uh, translated uh, onto new technologies. And we did that and implemented that in a, in a web platform, which you could use in Chrome and Firefox. So you had your sources on the left side, you uh, uh, drag and uh, drag them in and drop them here. You connected them, you could define filter conditions, you press a button and you'd get the skeleton for your application. Uh, and, you know, the usual visualization, inspection, whatever you get for free vi via data widgets. And that, again, is something where you can sell linked data technologies quite easily because that is a simple development tool. You put a little bit of brain power, more brain power into that, for example, you put it in as an, as an Eclipse project and you have a very nice development tool that frees you of all the unnecessary development jobs. We also built in a a Sparkle uh, toolkit. If you don't speak Sparkle, you can construct your Sparkle queries graphically in a Lego kind of way where the, the syntax decides where you can put certain things. Uh, you can also translate if you have an existing qu Sparkle query. You can visualize Sparkle queries and things like that. Lots of things that are not rocket science, other people have done, but are useful if you want to create applications efficiently. All right. This is the stream rule, this is the, the rule engine. Uh, we choose answer set programming and worked with uh, the guys in Potsdam uh, because they, on a regular basis, win the contests for efficient uh, answer set programming. And answer set programming has a couple of very nice properties which you like on the web. For example, answer set programming can deal with contradicting knowledge. It presents you all the solutions and not one solution at a time. It computes all solutions in parallel and things like that. It's quite nice. And then, uh, in good old uh, web tradition, we ate our own dog food. So that ended in February. That was probably the, the main project that integrated GSN, SQL, SQL Sparkle, LSM, and all the other technologies. And it's now available if you want to play around with that. Uh, it, it also puts... Uh, cloud and utility functions if you need these in the background. You can download a virtual machine, put it into your virtual box and play around with it. CityPulse is a running project where uh, we use that for real-time stream processing in cities where we also take into account tweets. And the nice thing that is that since we use only semantic web standards, we can deal with all these kind of data formats. It doesn't have to be sensors. In Vital, that's kind of like uh, pushing it a little bit. Uh, open IoT is one infrastructure that can do that. There are other infrastructures, but you can put a meta infrastructure on top of that and put uh, pushing the abstraction still a little bit further. And Gambas uh, was application of these technologies for autonomous service in smart transportation. So we did uh, a uh, service for the bus company in Barcelona with that. Now, and I'm nearly finished now. What we also did as a side product, and which is really important besides the research, if you want to get it, uh, get traction with that, you need to go into standardization. So we did a lot of standardization. There's now an RDF stream processing uh, uh, group there. The Semantic Sensor Network now, uh, Networks Ontology now goes into real standardization. And you need to build infrastructure so that other people can use it and play around with it. That's really important. Then there's all kind of, uh, let me put it that way, political lobbying. This is the Internet of Things European Research Cluster. Now that is actually part of IOT. That's a new uh, EU thing that's even bigger than IERC. Don't ask me to translate that. And uh, you also need to look at, because this is actually a genuine uh, semantic web business into M2M. I mean, machine to machine, that's semantics. But uh, we do not need uh, new and better standards. We could actually reuse the web standards, and this is what I'm pushing for at the moment. All right, and this is where I end. So I claim that with semantic web technologies, database background, a little bit of software engineering, you can actually credibly build scalable infrastructures for this Internet of Everything. So in essence, you can link everything. <laughs>